the easiest method of travel yet devised by man. There are 27 scheduled airlines. There are... Whenever I watch old film strips about flying in the 1950s, like the one you're hearing now, I picture a time when men who dress like Frank Sinatra and women who look like Jackie Onassis with gloves and hats and all of it got dressed up to fly and were served prime rib and treated like royalty on airplanes. And I imagine all of us wish we had lived during the golden age of flying if we could have afforded a ticket back then. However, today, on this episode of That Doesn't Happen Every Day, in which we interview everyday people about things that don't normally happen every day, we take you to a day in 1955 when the progress and forward-looking feel you hear in this announcer's voice about the future and about the jet age smacked hard into a wall of quartzite on a lonely mountain in Wyoming. Well, you can get an idea if you take an egg and throw that egg against the solid wall just as hard as you can. And that's what it did to the people. On October 6, 1955, three people at a logging camp in the snowy range of southern Wyoming saw a passenger liner flying less than 600 feet above the ground. The witnesses watched it disappear past the trees and other obstructions until one of them heard a noise in the distance that sounded, in his words, like a cannon firing or a mining blast. On today's show, we go to a series of oral histories about the worst air disaster that had happened in America to that date. The first soundbite is from Bob Foster's interview. He was the squadron commander for the Civil Air Patrol in Laramie, Wyoming, about 50 miles from the remote crash site. Eight o'clock or so, we were alerted that there was a missing plane and what the flight number was and all that stuff. I immediately went to the airport and got our airplane out. By that time, the Wyoming Air National Guard, I believe, is who actually spotted the, the crash scene. This is William Daly, who was involved with search and rescue while going to the University of Wyoming in Laramie. I was going to engineering school. I got a telephone call, and uh, they asked me to go up to the crash site. Forrest Kepler was a member of the UW Outing Club, a group of outdoor enthusiasts and mountain climbers. We heard about it on the radio, and it was at that time that the uh, outing club members, or some of the members, volunteered that we would go up. Anthony Romero was a United pilot who drove to the crash site to see if he could help. The tail of the airplane was hanging right off the mountain, the big streaks of oil down the side, all very visible from uh, Highway 130 going up through there. The job is always to see if there's anyone alive, see if there's anybody that you can save and all that good stuff. We proceeded to walk towards the crash. The rescuers and everyone else who showed up after the 7.28 a.m. crash arrived to find the wreckage of the DC-4 strewn for over 1,500 feet down the rugged slope of Medicine Bow's 12,000-foot high peak. It was a pretty nasty climb up there. It was dangerous to try to get across the boulder field. Some reporter up there fell and broke his arm on that icy stuff. As we walk along on the tail slope of the mountain while we start running into wreckage and like landing gears and main struts of the wing, and you look up there where you saw that the plane crashed and then you see those airplane parts clear back down here probably a quarter of a mile away. We went up to where the center of the wing section was. It's a slab of aluminum uh, girders and pieces of metal and all that kind of stuff. And there were debris all over the hill. Quite an ex experience to see what happened when you drive an airplane that I imagine they do around 300 miles an hour. We went right smack into that wall right there and did not move. We looked around in that wind section and that was the place that I saw the body of this woman. Mm. Let's see, she was no head, no arms. She was kind of underneath this wing section. And uh, at the time that I saw her, I thought it was uh, one of those life jackets. It was a bright orange color, to about the right size for a life jacket, about the right shape. There were 66 people on board, and there was no way that you could identify even a face to give you an idea how uh -huh. total the destruction was. You see what you recognize as an arm and a half of a torso and so on. I can remember things like the, the person 
that was the most recognizable was a black sailor who was in the very back of the plane, actually identify a whole body. I mean, you could see a body. Don Sims, who said he was picking potatoes when he got the call to go help, said he also saw the African-American serviceman. There was one intact body still strapped in. Everybody else has been thrown clear out of the thing. The death certificates from the flight show that three of the people who died that day were African-American. Daniel R. Alexander, age 18, Gilbert Neal Whitley, age 17, and Eugene Reynolds, age 28. All of them were in the armed forces, but Reynolds was in the army, and the other two were in the air force. Why did Bob mention a sailor? Maybe since the victim was wearing a uniform that had been through a plane wreck, it was hard to tell his branch of service. Or perhaps over time, the details of the story have changed. The other body I think that I can recall fairly vividly was a small baby that was probably 18, 12 inches long. It was very easy. The infant was so small, we didn't even want to send it down on the high line. We wanted to, actually I think we put it in one of the Kelty packs and just backpacked her down. But as I recall, that's the only two. The rest were arms and figures and legs. And There were two infants on board. Thomas Ackerman was 15 months old, traveling with his mom, Grace Ackerman, and the baby that Forrest is speaking of was Deborah Tucker. She was 20 months old, traveling with her mother, June Tucker. They had left Fort Lee, Virginia, where Mr. Tucker was stationed with the Army, to live with June's parents in Ogden, Utah, until Mr. Tucker had finished his military service. Mrs. Tucker's mom had received a letter from her daughter before the plane flew, saying, Dear Mom, I am scared stiff. This will be my first plane ride. If I remember the numbers correctly, they had 19 Army paratroopers that they were transporting for the military. And those people had shoes on their feet. They had feet in the shoes. And all the rest of the people didn't have anything. They were just, in other words, the Army boot held up. And the people would come apart right there and did. The story about the paratroopers in their boots is interesting. Around one-third of all the passengers were listed as active-duty military, two from the Coast Guard, four from the Army, and the majority were in the Air Force. Almost all of those airmen were between the ages of 17 and 19. Two of the newspapers from the Times said that most of these young airmen on the plane had just joined the Air Force and were on their way to training, with some or all of them headed towards Parks Air Force Base in California. One of them was Alfredo Minotes. He'd even brought his recruiter to his house the day after he turned 17 so that his mom could sign the paperwork for a minor to join. If all of the airmen on the plane were on their way to basic training, it's unlikely they would have their uniforms yet. However, if they were wearing uniforms, it's most likely they were wearing the nicer dress uniform, which was always worn with shoes and not boots. Is Mr. Foster wrong? The Deseret News and Telegraph did confirm the presence of one paratrooper whose body was found next to his Bible. He was most likely Myron Neil Manwill, who had just completed three years of Army service and was returning from Germany to Payson, Utah, to surprise his family. Paratroopers wore polished black jump boots with their dress blues, a practice that airborne units still continue today. Could that have been what started the story of the 19 paratroopers? One of many surreal memories shared was from William Daly about something in the plane that didn't involve deceased passengers. There was a tremendous air circulation there, and the air was uh, filled with these pieces of paper. And it turned out to be mail and stuff like that that was in the airplane. A lot of that mail was had burn marks on it, as I remember. Some of it was burned so badly you couldn't tell the addresses on it. And I don't know what happened to it. All I remember is I picked up as much as I could find. Uh, all of the stuff that you could identify was given to the post office. I remember one, it was addressed to a, a man, and it said something about they were happy about his new assignment and all that stuff. It sounded like he was in the military. And uh, there are no names that you could identify in there, so I don't know whether he was on the airplane or not, but it wasn't in an envelope. It was just floating around. I wanted to try to find out more about this, but given that so many of the passengers were service members, many of them could have recently received a new assignment and even been on their way to one, if the letter even applied to anybody on board at all. Mel Duncan was a Cheyenne-based historian, aircraft mechanic, and pilot who wrote a detailed report about the crash that I've linked to in the description. Duncan said there were actually 436 pounds of mail on the plane. About 100 pounds of it was recovered, but only about 32 pounds of it was still deliverable. 
Records say that eventually as many as 300 people came to the site, from groups as diverse as law enforcement, to the Red Cross, to members of UW's ROTC program. Forrest Kepler, along with many other members of his outing club, scaled the high walls of Medicine Bow Peak to help recover crash victims. He talks about the personal impact of seeing death at that age. Oh, I don't know if there's any physical challenges, more mental challenges. Actually, the climb is not that severe. Oh, just seeing the bodies and having to be around so many dead people. and I guess I, in my own mind I can remember some things, and I'm sure there's some things that blacked out. I just don't really care to remember. I saw quite a few people. They get sick. They're not used to that sort of thing, and it's, it's a kind of a grisly job. Uh, it was, of course, no fun for me, but it, I never did have to bother getting sick because I've been there before. I've been in on quite a few of them where the people had burned along with the crash, and it's uh, you get used to it, I guess you might say, or you're, you're aware that that's the way it is and nothing to be done about it. The mountainside where the plane crashed was walled in by boulders the size of cars, and some people say small rooms. It quickly became apparent that removing the remains of 66 crash victims, let alone the wreckage, was going to be very, very hard. Trying to get the bodies off, we had no body bags. We didn't really have an organization. We really didn't, everybody really hadn't put together and got organized, which we eventually did. Forrest and other mountain climbers from the University of Wyoming and the University of Colorado Boulder built a zip line out of cables that would carry remains in the body bags that had also finally arrived. Then we put a pulley system on it where you could put a body on it. The body weight would be take the body down, although we had a brake rope on it. That brake rope became a rope that you hauled the system back up. That was fairly simple. The bag remains were taken off the zip line at the bottom of its run, where stretcher bearers would take them over the rocks to a staging area where the terrain was better for horses. Okay, then they'd unzip the um, crash bag, take the body out, and of course, you're just standing there, you know, you either looked or you didn't, one or the other. Then they had just um, yards and yards and yards of uh, white canvas, and then they would write, wrap the body in this canvas, kind of mummy style, then they stepped back, and we took the body then, lifted it up, put it on the horse how we wanted it. Then they radioed, we was on our way. Once on horseback, the crash victims were taken to the nearby University of Wyoming science camp on the mountain. Their attempts were made to identify the bodies. Try and get a fingerprint, don't you know, in various ways and whatnot. I sure didn't want to spend very much time in there. <laughs> that was a little heavy for, for this child, I'll tell you. For several days to come, people recovering bodies slept at the science camp. United Airlines flew in food and a chef to cook for the recovery teams. Elaine Hertzfeldt, who was working at the camp, shared a poignant memory of some of the support personnel who showed up at the site. By the end of the week, there were families coming, and there were counselors that sat out on the front porch. That's where I saw them counseling the grief people. One of the family members of the victims who came to the site was Dr. Donald Kirk from Utah. After hearing that his wife Marion's plane had crashed, he flew to Wyoming on a military plane with blood donations and medicine hoping to help. The Deseret News and Telegram stated that on his flight to Wyoming, he saw the wreckage of Flight 409 from the window, despite all of the turbulence, and then set back, not looking out again. Probably because he saw how bad the wreckage was, and likewise, how the report of no survivors was probably correct. Our squadron worked five days to help actually remove the bodies, various and sundry members. I know that later on they decided, well, they ought to do something with the wreckage, and they brought in a, I think, an a Army National Guard howitzer and, and shot the mountain till the rocks fell down on it. An old film strip linked in the show's description of recovery efforts shows what appears to be members of the National Guard with a recoilless rifle, kind of like a bazooka firing up towards the crash site to help crush and cover the wreckage to deter souvenir seekers and people hoping to see something grisly. Given how small some of the pieces of the bodies were, and how easily they could slip into the spaces between the boulders and rocks, I had to wonder if all the remains were removed. When interviewing Forrest Kepler, Jeff Sturgar had the same question I did. Were all the bodies found? I think all pieces were put in bags and all bodies were named and identified. We didn't know then when we pulled everybody out. If we had, we thought we did. We did as good a job as we could. There's a grave in the Green Hill Cemetery in Laramie that reads, Medicine Bow Peak Airline Crash, October 6th, 1955. 
unidentified. This grave contains remains of smaller body parts that couldn't be linked to their owners. According to John Wagner of the American Heritage Center in Laramie, Wyoming, this grave was actually unmarked for many years until someone who knew the pilot and his family members visited the site and then paid for a marker to be made. We went into this and completely the voluntary thing. But I think you eventually United offered and we accepted about a hundred bucks a day and I think I got five or six hundred dollars. And that was awful big money in those days. Everybody that was involved in it got a gold engraved pin uh, from United. I got one. It was funny. They also gave all the people on the mountain a United parka, those blue parkas with hoods on them. They're real heavy, very nice, but they wanted those back. Uh, I know for a long time after around the university, you'd see guys wearing these United Airlines jackets. One picture that bothers me isn't a grisly one, but it does show the worried looks on the faces of Mrs. John Beck Mrs. Gordon Wilson and Mrs. Wilford Entz waiting for the arrival of Flight 409 at the Salt Lake City Municipal Airport. Originally, they'd been told the plane was going to land at 9.05 a.m. Then a second delay was announced. Then they were told the plane would arrive in five minutes. Eventually, a teletype message was read to everyone there saying the plane had been lost between Denver and Salt Lake. It wasn't until well after noon that they were told that a ground crew had reached the wreckage and radioed in that there were no survivors. One of the women there was Peggy Hawkins. She'd driven 85 miles from Eureka, Utah to Salt Lake City with her nine-month-old daughter. Her husband, Richard Hawkins, was an army corporal coming home from Germany after over a year to meet his daughter for the first time. The Deseret News reported that the son of one of the plane's casualties couldn't be found. His family believed he was possibly in San Francisco or Portland or Seattle and couldn't contact him to let him know that his mother had passed away in the flight. I hoped that his family was able to get a hold of him and that he didn't read about it in the newspaper. And we still all like to know, why did it happen? The official accident investigation report by the Civil Aeronautics Board said the probable cause of this accident was the action of the pilot in deviating from the planned route for reasons unknown. Because I, being a pilot, I knew where the airlines were, and I knew where he should have been, and he didn't have any business there. What Bob Foster says makes sense. Apparently, a more common route for planes going from Salt Lake City to Denver was to fly north to Rock River, Wyoming, and then head west to avoid the snowy range along the border where the plane crashed. Anthony Romero had flown the route from Denver to Salt Lake City while piloting for United and shares his theory about what happened. When this airplane crashed in the midst of Bo Peak, of course, our first impression as uh, pilots from the Denver area was that uh, somehow this pilot had to have been incapacitated because there's no way he would have flown right straight into the peak uh, in any kind of good weather. Remember earlier how William Daly said that he had found the remains of a woman who looked orange? Don Sims reiterates that, talking about the other bodies he saw. Yeah, legs and arms and, and everything was orange. And I, I, I mean, we're talking orange. When I first started to research the crash, some people said the orange color was the result of carbon monoxide poisoning that had leaked into the plane during the flight, incapacitating the pilots or even killing them, most likely coming from the nose heater that burned fuel in the front of the plane to keep everyone warm. Very possible being a little combustion heater that if it had had a leak of any sort, any kind of a malfunction, it could very well have filled the cockpit with carbon monoxide. Mm -hmm. Not only was Mr. Romero a pilot, but an experienced mountain climber. He was sent by United to see if he could find the remains of the heater on the mountainside, which his team was able to recover and send to Washington for testing. The, uh, the report we got was that they examined both the heater and they felt that they could not determine or whether the uh, nose heater actually had been leaking. So it was inconclusive. Did the pilots and possibly everyone else on the plane die or at least become too incapacitated to fly due to carbon monoxide poisoning? Well, for one thing, I've asked three different MDs what color people who die of carbon monoxide poisoning turn. They all agree people turn red or a cherry color, at least for a while, not orange. The American Heritage Center in Laramie has lots of pictures of the crash site and wreckage, but they only have one showing human remains. As soon as I saw it, I regretted asking for it, and I'd rather not get into how horribly damaged the bodies were. But I will tell you that the two men I saw looked more red-toned than orange. It was sort of like when you get a really bad sunburn. 
They'd been burned, possibly from the explosion that happened when the plane hit the mountain. It's also possible that additional tissue damage may have occurred as the bodies waited outside in the snow and thin mountain air for a while before they were recovered. To be fair, I only saw a photo of two of 66 bodies, and film and computer screens distort colors. John Wagner, who helped me find the photo, even said the hue of the bodies in the photos used to look more orange years ago. So what gave the orange appearance? I'm really not sure. Incidentally, the death certificates for everyone on board listed the cause of death as multiple severe injuries, and no autopsies were performed for anyone on board to verify or deny the possibility of carbon monoxide poisoning. Mr. Romero shared another theory about why the plane crashed. Uh, in those days, uh, there were only two pilots, and when you went on a layover and you ate dinner together, and that we thought very possibly food poisoning. By the way, nowadays, uh, since then, the airline is realizing that this is a potential hazard. Mm -hmm. For most of the rest of my career on United, the pilots were always given different meals when on the on board the airplane. Uh, when we go on layovers and stuff, we usually eat at different places. This reminds me of the comedy Airplane, in which both pilots become too sick to fly the plane because they both ate the fish. I didn't know this was ever an actual real concern. Mel Duncan was a Cheyenne-based historian, aircraft mechanic, and pilot, and he believes the following is what happened. As stated, it is a fact the plane was far off its planned course when it crashed, with pilots taking a normally safer but longer route. However, Mr. Romero's 2016 interview, recorded years after he had retired, reveals that he and other pilots flying from Denver to Salt Lake sometimes didn't always follow protocol. Now, the authorized route out of Denver going to Salt Lake and then on to the West Coast was to continue up north uh, to Sinclair. When the weather was good, it was just made much more sense to turn at uh, tie siding and, and cut right straight across. What they did was uh, not acceptable, but it was routine. Given that the flight was 83 minutes late when it left Denver, the pilots might have just been trying to save time by cutting over the snowy range. On the unauthorized but routine route Romero described, the crash report said the time a pilot would save going over the snowies was incredibly minimal. So why would someone do it? Expert testimony in a 1957 Civil Aeronautics Board hearing mentioned the reason why a shortcut over the snowy range wouldn't have saved time is because the pilots would have spent a great deal of time just climbing to the altitude necessary to safely go over the mountains. The crash report said that a plane that had broken the rules and flown over the snowies would have needed to fly at over 14,000 feet just to get over the 12,000-foot mountains there with enough safe clearance. However, what if to save time the pilots didn't fly that high? What if they, as Mel Duncan suggested in a 1997 article in the Salt Lake Tribune, chose to do some tree-top flying? Remember how the people at the lumber camp said the plane was very low? A pilot could save time and fuel by not having to climb so high, even though he'd be very low to the ground. The captain had flown from Denver to Salt Lake City 45 times in the past year. Had he broken protocol and gone over the snowies on those flights too? By the fall of 1955, had he done it enough to feel confident in flying very low? Also, how much visibility do you need to safely avoid a mountain? Mr. Romero said the questionable route over the snow age should only have been taken if the weather was good. Here's what some of the rescuers said of the weather that morning. I know exactly what the weather was like. Right at 7, I got in my car and observed, Man, you don't see days like this very often. The entire sky was clear. Medicine Bow Peak sticking up out there. About the top one-fifth of that mountain had a cloud cap on it. Now, right about that very instant is when that guy hit that mountain. He may have been hitting the mountain right when I was looking at it, because that's where the time frame is. I had seen a fog or a sort of a cloud drape over the mountain that morning as I went downtown to get a donut. I thought, that doesn't look very good up there. It should also be noted that the crash report does say that day there were snow showers of unknown intensity over the mountains. Mel Duncan pointed out that the altimeter, the instrument that says how high you are in the air, might have been off because they didn't readjust themselves to variations in air pressure. Perhaps the pilots thought they were higher than they were as they took the shortcut over the Rockies. According to the official crash report, the plane had a cruising altitude of 10,000 feet and struck Medicine Bow Peak at only 60 feet shy of its 12,000 foot summit. 
Could an even slightly bad altimeter reading, and possibly cloud cover, have stopped the pilots from seeing the mountain, or at least seeing it in time? The crash report says the plane struck the mountain trying to pull up, so could it have been an issue of pulling up too late because of limited visibility and a lack of knowing how high or low the plane really was? According to the crash report, another pilot who was flying about 22 miles away from the plane when it crashed had specifically been warned to stay away from the snowies because of the terrible downdrafts in the area. And there's almost always a downdraft if you fly in the mountains. That when you're on the east side of any peak, you're going to get a downdraft, and you're going to get an updraft on the west side. A downdraft, which is basically a bunch of wind pushing down the slope of a mountain, would have made it even harder to climb Medicine Bow Peak, especially with limited warning. It should also be noted that the planes that went to search for the crash all talked about the terrible turbulence and downdrafts near the crash site. Another thing people point out is if the pilot had just been more to the left or right, he would have missed the highest part of the snowies. Some people have said that might have been his intention, but his heading was slightly off. Between that and low visibility, the plane hit the peak. I hope that none of the remains of the victims are still on the mountain, but I do know for a fact that some of their personal effects and parts of the plane remain on the mountain. This was even after the shelling and eventual use of napalm on the site to destroy remains and further discourage souvenir seekers. John Sicarelli tells us about what people used to find on Medicine Bow Peak and his own experiences when he went there. You know, when they would go up there in the 70s, you could find sunglasses shoes, things of that nature. You know, I went out there just to hike. I'm not particularly looking for for wreckage. You know, I came across, um, you know, random wires and some chunks of aluminum fuselage. There's a couple Pratt & Whitney twin wasp radial engines out there. Uh, I I believe one might be submerged in a a glacial lake and it kind of, um, you know, presents itself when the, in the summertime. And you can see them, you could look into the, uh, cylinder walls and i remember picking up these pieces of metal and thinking wow 66 people who had kids family friends aspirations their lives were all extinguished on this mountain inside of this aluminum skin that i'm holding right now and it kind of made the experience a little bit surreal and a little bit sad to be frank you know out of respect um I, you know, I left everything I saw in the exact same spot I found it, and I would ask others to do that too. The first time I'd heard about the crash of Flight 409 was from my parents, who said members of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir had been on board. Sure enough, the 1955 Deseret News confirmed that five of the passengers were part of the choir and had been coming home from Europe. They had stayed longer than other choir members to sightsee after the group's European tour. Mr. and Mrs. Willardson of Salt Lake City, Utah, were also in the choir and supposed to board Flight 409, but it was full, so they took a plane that left after the faded DC-4. Miss Willardson said the flight attendant pointed out the window at the wreckage of Flight 409 as they headed towards Salt Lake City. I'm not sure what to say about this story. If that plane was the same kind of plane as Flight 409, it probably should have been flying further north than the crash site, just as Flight 409 was supposed to have been doing. From where they should have been, they shouldn't have been able to see the crash. At first I wondered if maybe their pilot was breaking the rules too, and they'd accidentally seen the crash, or even been asked to keep an eye out for the missing flight. However, if their plane was supposed to land in Salt Lake City at 6pm, it wouldn't have even left Denver until well after the midday finding of the crash by a military pilot. In fact, it probably didn't even leave Denver until the announcement went out that there were no survivors even so it's unlikely they would have needed any help from passenger planes by that time. Did their pilot, even after knowing about the wreck, choose to fly over the dangerous snowies? Was he also in a hurry? Or just curious? There are at least three or four other articles about people who missed the fatal flight, from choir members to service members to two Utahns who just adopted a baby and were bringing her home to Utah when their flight from Greece, where the little girl was from, was delayed causing them to miss the fatal flight. One of the passengers was the vice president of the Slovenia Electronics Company, which reminded me of how, growing up, we had an old Slovenia TV still in the house. Two of the passengers who died were, ironically, pilots themselves. One of them, Lowell Rickman, had even told his mother that he loved flying so much he would live and die on an airplane. The most unusual occupation I found on two of the death certificates were held by two men from Ely, Nevada, 
One was listed as the owner of the Big Four Whorehouse in Ely, Nevada, and the other was listed as bartender and co-owner of the Big Four Whorehouse in Ely, Nevada. I hope if an embarrassing occupation is listed on my death certificate, all it says is podcaster. The vast majority of the passengers were from Utah, followed by Colorado and Nebraska, but one was based in Hawaii working for Dole Pineapple. Mr. Dale Brown had flown back from Honolulu to the continental U.S. to pick up his 66-year-old mother and make a home for her in Hawaii. She had never flown before, and he wanted to be with her because she was nervous about flying. All of the passengers were listed as living in some part of the United States, but the oldest passenger, 72-year-old Constantina Palakitas, had been born in Greece back in 1883. While this crash had been the worst civilian air disaster in U.S. history at the time, it probably didn't stay in the public's memory as long as it might have. That's because less than 30 days later, a man put a time bomb in his mother's suitcase, then sent her off on a plane that would crash near Longmont, Colorado, killing her and 43 other people. John Gilbert Graham had been hoping to collect his mother's life insurance by blowing up her plane. Some say that his hearing about the crash of Flight 409 in the nearby mountains was his inspiration to commit the crime, and had his mother's plane not been delayed by ten minutes, its crash would have happened further north, closer to the snowy range. While the death toll from this crash wasn't as high as Flight 409's, it's likely that the sensational aspect of it, the televised court proceedings of the killer, and his eventual execution, took a great deal of public attention away from 409's crash. Also, only nine months after the crash of Flight 409, two passenger planes crash midair over the Grand Canyon, killing everyone on both flights. It's likely that the fact that it happened at a world-famous landmark the strangeness of two planes colliding in the air and a death count almost twice as high as Flight 409's probably did a lot to further decrease interest in Flight 409. In closing, I'd like to thank the American Heritage Center in Laramie, Wyoming. They helped me find these interviews and helped me with a lot of the other research I did. I also want to thank John Wagner of the American Heritage Center for all of his help finding research materials and for his patience with my unending questions. Finally, I want to thank John Siccarelli for his enthusiasm about this project and for his willingness to also answer a lot of questions, help me find research materials, and to help clarify things as well. If you would like to see video of the crash site, I'm going to put a link in the description of film taken right after the crash, courtesy of the American Heritage Center. If you go to YouTube and Google United Flight 409 Crash Wyoming, you'll see videos many people have shot of the crash site today and see many of the remaining artifacts and even some personal effects. I would also like to thank all of the interviewees and interviewers you heard on the show. Bob Foster was interviewed by Kelly Conway. William Daly was interviewed by Amy Lawrence, and she also interviewed Don Sims. Forrest Kepler was interviewed by Jeff Sturgard, and Elaine Hertzfeld was interviewed by Lisa Cochran. If you would like to learn more about the 66 victims of Flight 409, their names are listed in the description, and I've also included links to the American Heritage Center that has photos and lots of information about the crash and the people who died that day. Please stay tuned and please share the story with someone who you think might be interested in it. I hope to have another podcast to you within the next two weeks. Thanks and have a good day.